this stuff leads to an enormous amount of risk, an enormous amount of both personal data that's at risk, a moving heavy object that carries a payload, if you will, that is at risk and moves us to a whole new frontier of cybersecurity. How do we manage that? This is not like having your Twitter account hacked. This is a very different sort of a risk profile, of course. So here come the first of our three short panels on that, and then I'm going to uh, come up here and take questions on their behalf as we do with the lightning rounds. Uh, if you'll first uh, help me welcome, uh, from the University of Michigan Transport Research Institute, which is very likely the single hotbed in this country of this kind of research, especially around autonomous cars and security. Please welcome research scientist Andre Weimerskirsch. Hello everyone. So unfortunately Chris isn't here and he would have told you how we can basically hack into everything. Um, so let me ask you, who knows about the Jeep case? Excellent. Who knows about the progressive dongle? Eh, not so many. Um, so you, you hopefully understood, yes. Automotive cyber security is real. Yes, we can hack into cars. Yes, we can hack into insurance dongles. Yes, we can hack into pretty much everything that's out there. So I will talk a bit about what can we do against it. And before I start, um, let me say automotive is so different than other industries. Um, in automotive, we have safety, you know, you want to have a safe car, obviously. Um, in automotive, we have a super complex uh, supply chain. We have like hundreds of suppliers and we have a fairly complex product that has like a thousands of components. If we look at security, um, Naturally, we look at what do other industries doing. Enterprise IT doesn't really apply one by one, right? Um, it's, it's not safety relevant, it's not mobile, it's very different. If we look at mobile phones, that's already fairly close to automotive, but again, it's not really safety relevant. If we look at SCADA, that is somewhat safety relevant, but it isn't really mobile. So there's no industry where it just, where we could just use the solution. The, the bad news is for the attackers, that doesn't really apply. If we look at the vulnerabilities, um, we just need an attacker that understands a tiny bit of automotive because he's familiar with like enterprise IT and they can hit the car. So what can we do? There's a lot of stuff already going on. Intrusion detection systems, firewalls, secure software updates, and secure architectures and whatnot. And um, that's currently where we are working on, where automotive is working on. But I feel we need to do much, much more. The first thing we need to do is we need to look at, coming back to other industries, we need to look at what what they did really right, what, whether they are really advanced, um, and then use that for automotive. A good example is the iPhone. They do a lot of stuff right, so let's just use that. And then we need to start pushing research um, really applied into cars, do what, when I started doing cybersecurity like 15 years ago, research already looked at certain technologies in cybersecurity, like secure operating system, formally verified source code, all that really cool stuff. And here we are 15 years later, and it's still not used in the, in the real world. And I feel automotive, that's the combination where it makes sense to use it. So let's start doing that. But it's, it's more than that. We need to invent new cyber security. We need to fuse the cyber physical system features of cars, you know, the real world aspects with cyber security. And that's something we do not have anywhere else. We do not have it on smartphones or wherever. To give you one example, um, let's look at automated cars. 
They use a, an area of sensors like camera, radar, LiDAR, wireless connectivity. And we know each of the sensors can be hacked. Yes, we can forge LiDAR, we can forge radar, we can at least uh, deactivate a camera, we can blind it, we can forge wireless communication. So when we design solutions, we can use the, the security level of each of these sensors. We know that um, we know that a camera is pretty secure. You can blind it, but you cannot forge the camera picture. We know wireless connectivity is pretty easy to hack into. We know radar and LiDAR is somewhere in the middle. So let's introduce a confidence level and let's fuse that all together and now figure out how to make it secure. And actually I work on it, so yes, we can use these features to make it secure. But what we need to understand is that cybersecurity in the future will limit features what we can do in cars. It will really be, there will be features that we can implement if it wouldn't be for the hackers. So we need to more often learn to understand, no, we cannot do this one. We need to wait until, yes, we have a solution. So, to conclude, um, automotive cybersecurity is really unique. Do not make the mistake to assume, yes, you just use what's out there. You just reapply what's available for smartphones. It will not work. We need to go far beyond traditional IT security. Uh, we, I feel at least we really need to push forward uh, cybersecurity research. You know what we did for like lots of things we did for 15 years. Now it's the time to go for it. That's the application to really motivate these new security solutions. And we also need to say sometimes, no, we can't do it. We, we cannot make that feature secure. So let's wait until we can. All right, thank you. Thank you, Andre. Well, Andre will be available for questions when we get to the uh, end of our three panelists here on the lightning round. So up next, uh, let's get right to the heart of a company that is in the business of doing exactly this, of securing digital connected cars. Please welcome a uh, founding partner of Autoimmune, Carl Helmer. Thank you. Good afternoon. So the problem that I'm going to address is a problem of talent or engineers that are trained in this space. Um, West Point is a uh, great American institution that's been around for about 200 years, and uh, their graduation is iconic for me. It's picturesque. It, uh, it's also, I think, uh, evocative of a couple things. Here you've got a bunch of people that are uh, celebrating, throwing their hats in the air. And uh, so in 2015, for about the 200th year, this class graduated exactly zero cybersecurity engineers, exactly the same number that uh, MIT graduated or that Carnegie Mellon graduated, or frankly, that the University of Michigan graduated or anybody, because in 2015, there were no bachelor's programs for automotive cybersecurity engineers even among the great engineering colleges. And while that might have been a reasonable number, and it might have been reasonable to lack an automotive cybersecurity program you know, five, 10 years ago, it's no longer particularly reasonable. Cars are too important. Connected cars are too important. The other thing about this picture is the celebratory nature shows that they're intent on starting a, a new life and uh, contributing to our society. So it's also odd that a significant growth area, automotive cybersecurity, is not an option that they can take based on their degree program. And it's also odd that they can't help our society in one of the critical needs that we have, which is securing our connected cars. Now this, uh, this photo comes from U U.S. Department of Transportation. 
It represents their notion of uh, connected vehicles, V2V, V2I, vehicles communicating with each other, vehicles communicating with the infrastructure, getting information from those distant points, and then making decisions about uh, what information it presents to the driver or maybe actions it takes. You see, without cybersecurity, we can't really have safety. Without vehicular cybersecurity, we can't really have vehicular safety. And without vehicular safety, we can't have the trust, which is fundamental for users adopting this, uh, this capability, this technology, and using it uh, in our society. There will be pushback until we can assure that, that people are safe. And so one of the problems is it's actually kind of hard to make an automotive cybersecurity engineer. I've been forming or running teams of uh, you know, pen testers and hackers for about 25 years. I've been working with automotive cybersecurity for about five. Um, the first thing is, as, as my colleague Andre pointed out, cars are entirely different. They do not act like traditional IT systems. There are different problems. The second thing is, um, without experience and contact to, the, to the, the, the objective system, the car, you can't really get the information you need. It, it turns out that people that do well have got a good hardware or electrical engineering background. They also know some computer science, and, uh, and they also have to understand how cars work. We don't have, that I'm aware of, a curriculum that takes the right classes and right experiences from those different fields and blends them together in a way that produces the engineers which our society, which this, this uh, industry desperately needs. And so um, the MEDC, Michigan Economic Development Corporation in Michigan, uh, has, has set out to change that. There's outreach currently underway to talk to OEMs, to talk to suppliers, to talk to universities, and to talk to cybersecurity firms. The point is to find out what the perceived needs are and harmonize them or get a unified base. Each OEM is going to want to do things a little bit different, and there's differentiation and brand distinction, and that's fine. But from the inputs that we're getting from them, we can establish a common base, work with a number of universities to quickly adopt those things into a curriculum, and then critically important, we have uh, the recommendation of two different internship programs. The first is pretty reasonable. Go work for an OEM or go work for a supplier. But that's not enough, not for a cybersecurity engineer in the automotive space. You also have to take a turn working for uh, a hacking firm a hacking company. You don't get to understand how breaking happens by being a maker or developer. It just doesn't work that way. You understand how breaking happens by living with the people that do that. Conversely, you don't understand necessarily how to build a secure system without working and living with the makers. And so at the end of this program, what we believe is we'll have engineers that have had experience with both of those two camps, that have a common base of education that they will then be able to apply either to uh, the assessment and quality assurance side or to the development side. And Michigan is, a, is a already taking a lot of steps in, in uh, connected car and cyber automotive. Here are four little examples. There's uh, the Michigan Cyber Range, which has multiple certifications and is a sandbox test for assessments uh, for unclassified systems. M-City is a new 32-acre campus that is a first-in-the-world intelligent connected car testbed environment. We also have military bases that are specifically open and inviting uh, companies to come in and do dual-use R&D for both military and commercial systems. And Michigan is also home for the uh, SAE Cyber Auto Challenge, which extends, uh, extends automotive cybersecurity engineering, not just through college, but also to high schools. So in Michigan, we have a deep desire to create, attract, and retain talent in the cyber community, specifically for automotive cybersecurity. Automotive is really at home in Detroit and in Michigan. And uh, one thing to think about, there's lots of talk about the, uh, the cycle plan and how long it takes to develop, vet, and get a product inside of cars. But I suggest to you that the longest lead time item for the automotive supply system is qualified engineers 
that understand the cybersecurity aspects of a connected vehicle. Thank you. Thanks, Carl. M-City truly is amazing, if you haven't uh, kept up on that. That's an amazing uh, just opening facility. It's really gonna be the physical place where the self-driving car, the connected car, is gonna really start to be explored in very great depth. Uh, the last of our three in this particular round I wanna bring up is a guy who has got a very interesting and very expansive view of what's going on with so many aspects of privacy, regulation, and how we're gonna get these vehicles on the road that are connected, self-driving, and manage so much about policy, about risk, about how they're put forward in our society through regulation and how they're seen in so many of these ways that are the infrastructure of acceptance, if you will. A former head of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, now a partner at Venable's Law Firm, where he brings together a troika of consumer data protections and privacy, consumer advocacy, and his experience as an automotive regulator. Please welcome my friend David Strickland. Thank you, Mark. Go get him. That's it. Well, good afternoon. I know that we're uh, tailing off the end of the afternoon, the sessions, and uh, been a lot of wonderful things. It's always great to be a share of the stage with two great luminaries here. I, unfortunately, am the hack lawyer of the group, and I'm going to tell you how the federal government is going to help you in this particular situation dealing with cybersecurity. And I say that quite facetiously because uh, the one thing you learn very quickly in a very static environment, especially in government, is that Government is meant to be slow, thoughtful, keeping things static, and cybersecurity, frankly, the entire automobile industry and universe is anything but that. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the challenges of how the industry can help the regulators, how the regulators can help the industry, and frankly, well, do we, how do we build this future together? Up here is what we've been talking about for Several years now, when I was at NHTSA and going forward, is that we have all of these inputs into the vehicle, all these vulnerabilities in the vehicle, nothing that everybody hasn't seen before, nothing new. But trying to think about this notion and trying to explain to you know, uh, a legislator about how do you build the firewall? How do you have the ability for a vehicle to continue to do all these wonderful things and provide all these support mechanisms, but still be safe? And, that is the constant challenge. One of the things that the industry has done affirmatively and, and I think is a, an amazing first step is the Auto ISAC or the Information Sharing and Analysis Center. Um, Global Automakers and the Auto Alliance came together um, to help um, create, form, and fund this ISAC to help share information about cyber threats, which is one of the key issues is how you help to fight in a very dynamic universe is being able to make sure that we all know about the threats that, are, that each other are facing in a, frankly, in a way that you can be able to share and share safely and develop countermeasures. And uh, the ISAC is actually gonna be, I think, going live, 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 I believe, next week. So it's been a very uh, long road. It took us about a year and a half or so to get this thing done. But this is the next great first next step for us in how we protect against cyber threats. One level of many, but it is a foundational step that's used in other critical infrastructure. And frankly, the automobile, even though it is a consumer product, is officially now critical infrastructure. Then, funny thing happened on the way to the forum. You have all this activity, you plan an ISAC, you plan all these things, and then you have a couple of intrepid hackers um, one very scared journalist, and frankly, an article that changed everything. This article, while still you know, having to have some access to physically to the vehicle, it changed the shape of everything because now people, legislators, see the next reality. They really can hack a car and take it off the road. What are we gonna do about this? And so what happens next, the next similar event, you had 1.5 million vehicles recalled. Probably one of the first time a vehicle has been recalled in my units is going on almost 50 years old. I think this is the first time a recall of this type has ever happened. And this will be part of the new normal. And also, this is also indicative of, frankly, ways that I think an automobile manufacturer should handle information on cyber threats and how it shouldn't. Now, as part of that recall, 
you either bring your vehicle into the dealership as a normal recall as executed, or FCA provided these little, uh, uh, these USB sticks so you could flash your own vehicle at home. But you still needed physical media through the mail, clunky. Versus Tesla, which has now executed two vehicle modifications which avoided massive recalls because they were able to flash you know, over the year or make changes over the year, which is frankly also gonna change the face and not only in cybersecurity, but how you deal with addressing cyber threats maybe in the future. Because you will be having this constantly changing and very dynamic environment. Is it easier to get people who say, seven out of 10 people usually get their cars fixed through a recall anyway, so that means 30% of them approximately don't. Or you can flash every car in your fleet that has a problem without having to have a customer being part of the intervention loop, which is also a very important thing to think about long term on how we deal with cyber threats as they emerge. Now these two ISO standards are also part and parcel of how everyone's gonna start thinking about dealing with cybersecurity threats. Uh, the first one, 29147, deals with the internal disclosure you find your own problems or threats. And that really is your red team or blue team internally, you find the problem, you address it, you get it filtered up. The second one, 30111, is how you take in information from an outside party, a white hat hacker, et cetera. And these two particular ISO standards are very important for the industry, especially the second one. How do you deal with information coming in to you as an OEM about a vulnerability? You know, Chris and Charlie had been communicating with Chrysler for a huge amount of time and they did nothing with the information. So they go to Wired, they get a huge article, and then you have your own new version of less controlled uh, chaos. So this, frankly, may be the foundation of the new normal of how every automaker has to deal with this, not only internally, which they're very good at, but externally, which clearly there's gonna be issues on how they work these things through. Last but not least, as I said before, here is the federal government, and they are here to help you. When you see articles like you saw the one in Wired and all the other testimony they've been getting, bills get written. Bills get written that not, not necessarily may not be all that informed because you're truly really trying to goose the regulator and the industry to fix a problem. So you end up with the Spy Car Act, Study Act, there was a provision in the next highway reauthorization in Title III which tried to deal with some of these issues. The Federal Trade Commission has a traditional role, and then you have NHTSA and DOT dealing with the recall process. You have a lot of activity happening at the federal level where frankly the industry and everybody is trying to sort of figure out what is the right approach to protecting vehicles and cybersecurity. So this really is the true beginning of the new normal. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of people at the federal level that have a lot of answers for it, which means we have to be more proactive in thinking about creating a foundation information for those answers. And with that, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's pretty good. You got a bark. <laughs> not everyone gets one of those. That's high praise. Okay, well, we've got a few minutes here to take some questions, and this is, uh, this is such an important area, uh, securing these cars and getting it out there, not just for the actual security and safety, but also to make sure that as we go to market, the perception is one that this has been dealt with and dealt with properly in a way that people can digest and understand and trust. Uh, yes, your, uh, your question for this panel. My question is, you said that uh, cybersecurity will limit functions of cars. What kind of functions will it limit? Like, I can't go through the drive through and pay for my hamburger? Or, you know, what kind of functions will cybersecurity limit? No, so you can still pay your burger. Oh, thank um. you, and pay for the gas too. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking, for instance, about automated cars where ideally we have vehicle platoons where, you know, cars drive, follow each other at like very uh, little distance and but that requires that you have a wireless connectivity between the cars, but we learned that the wireless connectivity is the weakest, call it a sensor. So probably we can't, you know, just have one car follow the other one within like one yard, but we need to have far more distance between the cars so that radar and LiDAR can jump in if the wireless connection is uh, hacked. 
right? Yes, please. Also, do. as a as follow up, you know, when you're thinking about limitations because of cyber protection, the thing that you have to think about is it's a safety related defect, which is what the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration deals with. What poses an unreasonable risk? So what may happen is as you see functions happen over time, there may be things and crashes that happen that we don't anticipate, and the agency may, using its defect authority, say that particular functionality creates an unreasonable risk of safety, and you're going to have to eliminate it or limit it. So the talking about how cyber may possibly limit function, I think there's going to be functionality that's going to be made available, and then you're going to see responses in the marketplace and with the regulator, which may frankly limit those functions. So I think there's the other piece of it as well. Any thoughts on that, Carl? Uh, several. So one of the notions uh, is that of cyber hygiene. I've been talking about that for a while. With your computer or your tablet or your cell phone, you have great uh, latitude to load anything you want on it. I can engage in behavior that's, uh, you know, frankly, fairly unsafe with my phone. Um, I'm at liberty to download things that erase all of my Excel spreadsheets. Right? Mm -hmm. But in an environment where my choices directly affect a heavy vehicle that can have a kinetic effect, uh, there is incumbent upon the user a sense of responsibility on how they interact and the kinds of things they download and the care they take to make sure that, that their system is uh, ascribed to some sort of user best practice doctrine, which are essential. I have not heard a lot of discussion about that, but it needs to happen because it is impractical and frankly uh, not fair to burden an OEM with any possible download choice that any given user might want to have. And so uh, does cybersecurity best practice perhaps limit some user choices? It must. Mm -hmm. This is sort of analogous to saying in a car, unlike on your web browser, on your machine, you're not allowed to click on anything, right? Yes, right. Open an attachment, if you will, in, mm -hmm. in that same motif. There's going to have to be a regulation of what freedom you have to to modify your car to some degree. Is that sort of what we're looking at? Well, I mean, there is going to have to be that limitation, but there's currently a, uh, uh, actually a change in the uh, copyright laws in DCMA 1201, which allows researchers now more access to the vehicles for research purposes. But that's one of the things, one of the arguments against by the industry was that people accessing our vehicles doing particular things actually maybe, you know, have some real issues for us. So that is the adjunct of that as well. But as you can tell, there's that tension. You want to have some ability to take a look at systems so you can see vulnerabilities and do research and learn. But as Carl said, you're going to have to make some choices that you can't simply just use this product in the way that you want to because you pose a societal risk mm -hmm. for the things that you do. Yeah, cars are always part of society, not just personal property. Sir, your affiliation, what's your question for our panel? Hi, I'm Jared Dorman. I worked in IT security for a while, but I'm new to the automotive industry. Um, I recently read an article where it talks about a lot of the protocols are more open because of federal mandates uh, so that, for example, an OEM couldn't lock it down so that only they could diagnose their car. Aftermarket mechanics can also, you know, see them and things like that. So uh, there's a problem there where if anybody can, can look at those diagnostics, for example, I buy a Honda and then I go to a... a a mechanic that's not Honda affiliated, they have to be able to see those diagnostics. But any any protocol that that's widely accepted is going to be more accessible to hackers. So how do you lock down those things and still allow the aftermarket and aftermarket market mechanics access to those diagnostics? Do you guys have any thoughts on that or on how those regulations can be rewritten? I can start. So I, I personally believe um, protocols, cars, should be secure by design, not by obscurity. So what you mention is pretty much security by obscurity. You don't publish the way the diagnostics protocol works or, or the way communication the car works. And the right approach is actually to have full control over it by using security technologies to really make it secure, publish it how it works, but design it in a way that it's still secure, and we actually know how to do that. So that's the good news. And car makers are working on this. So there's two different words. One's confidentiality, the other's integrity. Uh, somebody being able to see the packet and the information in it uh, is, a, is a confidentiality issue. It might not be critical to obscure or hide 
the, the content or the structure of a, of a packet. In fact, it probably shouldn't be, uh, at least if it's not private C information. That's different from uh, making sure that the information isn't changed in transit or that an issued command is a command that's received. That's an integrity issue. I, I think that there's a lot of efforts underway currently to build integrity into uh, cars going forward. But, but the commands are probably going to be transparent. Yeah. David, any thought on that? No, I think they cover them both. I mean, I think it's excellent. Okay. I have one last question for you guys uh, before we let you go. And this is, uh, we talked a lot about, uh, this is a different battle for security. We had to secure computers when they got connected to the internet. That was a major techno-cultural shift. We had to secure our phones. Suddenly we're carrying an enormous amount of personal uh, value and information on our devices. We've had to learn how to secure those. Uh, but this is the first time that consumers have come face to face with securing something that has physical uh, ramifications. Are we, what is really gonna be the trigger to get that done? Does it have to come from regulators? Is there enough consumer voice to demand it? I look at how many times consumers have squawked about credit card breaches or viruses or anything like that that should have been protected against, and yet those same consumers, 11 years running, their number one most common password is password, as surveys show every <laughs> single year. We don't do our part. We bark a lot, we don't bite much as consumers, certainly not in this country, a little different EU and UK. What is going to be the real trigger to make sure this job gets done with the high stakes it has? Does it come down from regulators? Do we push it up from consumers? How does it really work? What's the big difference on this versus other securing projects we've had to do? I, I can start. So, All right. Well, I, I believe we need a, call it regulation or whatever, at least minimum requirements in terms of security. Um, how secure does it need to be? But then we need to leave it to the market to make it secure in an efficient way, you know, because that's competitive. Mm -hmm. So largely agree. I, I think that uh, a governmental agency needs to establish something called a MER minimum essential requirements or a MER list. Um, however, um, you know, let, let, let's be honest. The OEMs are deeply committed to solving this problem. Uh, they're hiring hundreds of cybersecurity engineers. They're working to improve specifications. Uh, there is a strong desire not to have recalls, not to jeopardize their customers. There is a deep, uh, there's a, a deep commitment to this from the industry side. I think that most consumers are going to lag this. I don't think it's going to be consumer demand absent a, a lot of other news articles. I mean, yeah. if, if they come, then there will be a, an outcry for it. But I think the people that are best able to establish the protections and put them on vehicles are going to be the automotive ecosystem now coming from government to the OEMs and then to the vendor community that does things such as, you know, uh, making sure that, that in-memory running processes are obscured and can't be, can't be um, reverse engineered well, or making sure that you've got an updated velocity that, that uh, you know, puts the, the, the platform ahead of the ability of a hacker to exploit it, even if they find a weakness. David, you have a healthy sense of skepticism about the role of government in this. I will say this. I mean, there's two, we're dealing with the notion of standard of care. And I agree with both of my panelists that there has to be a foundational regulation to establish a baseline standard of care. But what Carl described is absolutely right. What's going to really be the driver for this, the hygiene of cybersecurity, is going to be the risks being taken by the OEMs, anticipating consumer use and abuse, the attackers that are outside, and that's really what's going to drive the system into raise level. Because at the end of the day, whatever NHTSA standard is there, is going to be quickly eclipsed because of what happens in the environment. So that's the long-term you know, outlook is how you sort of deal with standard of care issues. But with that being said, there's also going to have to be a new normal for consumers, that you are going to have to be used to limitations because it is a vehicle. You're going to have to be used to not having the freedoms to make changes or to, you know, you could use lock picks. Yeah. If you can input in your GPS while you're underway, the things that people do now, mm -hmm. there's going to have to be a new normal for consumers as well as a personal responsibility. Very good. It's almost like the MVP concept we had earlier. Maybe there's almost an MRP, minimum responsible product, mm -hmm. that yeah. we set that base and then let the market correct or, or, or innovate on top of that. Can we have a hand for our panel? Some really great minds on security and safety in vehicles. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much.